Are we live? Okay. Well, good evening, everybody, and very warm welcome to the Leadership Hustings on Education, Skills and Culture. I'm Sue Garden. I speak for the Liberal Democrats and the Lords on universities, colleges, apprenticeships and skills, post-18 education, but we're a small team, so I find myself doing schools and nurseries and a number of other things as well. We're multi-talented in the Lords, you know. I was a school teacher on and off um, in England and Germany during 24 moves with my RAF husband. And then I worked for 20 years for City and Guilds on vocational qualifications. So I'm an unreserved champion of technical and practical education and skills, which are too often overshadowed by our obsession with academic prowess. Anyway, enough of that. We're extremely fortunate to have two such creditable candidates for leadership as Ed and Layla, very different, but both with tremendous skills and energy. And just before we come to them, I have to thank Jack Coulson, who's put this event together, and for calling me last night to tell me there was a vacancy to chair this evening, so I'm <laughs> privileged to be able to fill it, although rather at the last notice, but of course in the laws we're here to serve. We shall be here for 80 to 90 minutes, we're live on YouTube and Facebook. And we have two wonderful British sign language interpreters with us. We have Harjit and Claire, who will be doing the sign language uh, for those who are hard of hearing. You have supplied a great many terrific questions from which the team have extracted 10 or 11 for us to start with. So thank you to all those who submitted questions and apologies if yours hasn't been chosen. We should be monitoring the YouTube chat and we want to hear questions from the audience. I'm about the limit of my technical prowess. So I'm surrounded by different gadgets, which I hope I'll be able to manage in some way or another. And I'm sure the team will feed me if I fall flat on my face with one or other of them. So our candidates have three minutes for their opening addresses to us. And this evening we are starting with Layla. Layla, your three minutes starts now. Well, firstly, thank you, Sue, for stepping in at the last minute and welcome everyone uh, to this evening. Improving the life chances of our children is why I got into politics. The fundamental mission of our party of liberalism is to build and safeguard a free and fair society in which no one shall be enslaved by poverty, ignorance or conformity. Education, skills and culture must be at the core of how we address the deep seated inequalities that have been made all the worse by the coronavirus pandemic and deliver a country where every individual thrives. I worked as a physics teacher for well over a decade before I was an MP. And that real world non-Westminster experience has shaped my entire political outlook. And it's why education is front and center of my campaign as one of my three E's, education, the environment, and the economy. Focusing on education is about communicating and indeed acting on our liberal values. Look at Kirsty Williams and what she's done in Wales as the Liberal Democrat education spokesperson, and then compare her to the shambolic Gavin Williamson. This pandemic has exposed just how far we still have to go to tackle deep-rooted inequality and build a system where our children are world ready, not just exam ready, and where everyone has the skills to thrive. The world around us is changing and actually has been for some time. And yet how we teach and skill our children hasn't. In fact, under Govan Cummings in particular, we went backwards to the 1950s where children's heads were vessels to be filled, not curious minds to be unleashed. As education spokesperson, I've spoken at major education union conferences and I've worked cross party with campaign groups. And that's the leadership I will show if you elect me. Listening to experts, to parents, in order to put our children first. But it's not just about the young. Access to education throughout one's life is a fundamental right. And with more and more adults needing to retrain, we also need to be the party of reskilling too. But coronavirus hasn't just exposed problems in education. It has decimated the cultural sector, a critical soft power for the United Kingdom. And that's why I've called on the government to set up a cultural protection fund to secure the future of our arts and music industries for as long as it takes. We can't afford to leave the creative industries behind. My vision is to ensure that every individual has an equal opportunity from cradle to grave to not only access, but also be enriched by learning and culture, where our cultural sector is prized and our education system is truly world-class. 
So vote for me and let's change our party so that we can change the country. And let's move forward together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leila. Ed, would you like to give us your three minutes worth? Education is the liberal promise. The promise to every individual to help them make the most of their abilities so everyone can be free to be themselves. The promise of equal opportunity. So no matter your background, you get a real chance in life. So society becomes fairer. Here's my radical view. In England, education is not delivering that liberal promise. I say England because while this election is for the federal leader, I won't tell the Scottish Liberal Democrats their education policy. And Kirsty Williams, our brilliant Welsh education minister, needs no advice from me. In England, of course, there are large numbers of teachers, pupils, lecturers and students hard at work doing well. But who really believes England's education machine is delivering the liberal promise? English education is so centralised, standardised, regularised. Is that liberal? And even as education has become so managerial and technical, our system seems so incapable of, quicking, of equipping people for the skills for the digital world of today, let alone tomorrow. All so apparent during COVID lockdown. So my pitch is simple. As leader, I'd like the party in England to rethink education radically, starting with education's purpose. Conservatives and Labour compete over a technical debate around standards imposed top down, rigid. I want us to start with the individual, their needs, their creativity, their choices. I want to trigger a new liberal education debate where, yes, we equip everyone with the basic tools to learn of reading, writing and arithmetic, but where we rethink how well funded state education can best liberate a person's talent and foster their well-being, not crush it, as too often happens now. For me, a rethink education debate starts with the crucial early years, preschool, reception and infants, where evidence shows that you have the best chance to improve the life chances of those from most disadvantaged backgrounds. Our party's policy to treble the pupil premium for early years is a good first step, building on that great Liberal Democrat education policy success. But I'd like us to be bolder. That's why, like Joe, I want the party to back universal free childcare. I want to address the academic and vocational divide which stifles so many people's creativity. I want us to rethink the role of the local community and local government in education. Friends, if our party can rethink education skills and culture, we will win elections on education like we used to. I'm proud to have helped devise the penny on income tax for education slogan that played a key role in successful elections in 92, 97 and 2001. We need to lead again on education, to cut through again on education. If we do, we will appeal to parents in their millions and deliver the liberal promise of education. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. Those were fantastically inspirational opening statements. So this is boding well. Right, we'll now go on to one of the questions which has been submitted. Uh, and this one's been submitted from Beth Taylor, who says COVID-19 has created real challenges for schools. Some are high level long-term challenges. In particular, the lockdown experience has widened the inequality between the standard of education that state and private schools are resourced to deliver. Can you see a way to bridge this gap for the future? And I think there is real concern that underprivileged children have suffered far more than others during the lockdown. So who would like to start on that one? Leila, do you want to kick off on that one? I'd love to. Thank you, Beth, for your question. So this has been what I've absolutely been focusing on from the moment that coronavirus uh, came along. And there are, it's huge. So to answer this succinctly in two minutes is difficult, but let me just underline a, a couple of things that I think are, are critically important. The first is to your specific point around state versus private. What we've been seeing is that on the one hand, private schools have been obviously better resourced. Um, and that has meant that children have been getting very high quality online lessons almost right from the get-go. Meanwhile, in England, 
there are estimated 700,000 children who don't have access to laptops and broadband. And the government, in their wisdom, has actually only ever even tried to provide 330,000 of those. That means that nearly half of the children who we know don't have access to education aren't getting it. And it has been an utter shambles the way the government has mismanaged schools and coronavirus. They have not been clear. They have not been transparent. They have not released the minutes from the scientists so that those uh, head teachers, hardworking teachers and head teachers who have only ever wanted the best for their children haven't been able to plan. And looking towards September, we now understand there might be trade-offs that need to be made. Do we open schools or close pubs? Well, obviously schools needs to be the priority, but the government still hasn't released what the changed plans would be. And in the end, what this means is that that deep seated inequality that I spoke about in my opening statement, you know, the fact that in this country, your life chances are far better linked to the socioeconomic background of your parents than your own content and character, that your access to the world to be able to thrive is not your own. That is going to be made worse. And I'm deeply, deeply concerned that those inequalities are going to rise. We already saw over the last few years that educational inequality has not been improving. In fact, it's gone the other way. And the Tories have no grip of the situation. So that is the problem. The solution is actually Gavin Williamson taking a look across at what Kirsty Williams has been doing in Wales. It's working with teachers, with schools, co-creating the answers, not imposing top-down uh, solutions that don't work on the ground. Trust our teachers, trust our parents, give them the support and funding that they need, and that's how we're going to get through this crisis. And I hope we get another question about what we do on the other side, because that's a whole other issue. Thank you, Leila. Yes, it's quite extraordinary. The government's very proud of saying we have the best teachers ever, and then they don't actually trust them to do things. Ed, how about you? How do you feel about this divide between the disadvantaged and the, the private and state se sectors? Well, I just think it's one of the most awful things of the COVID crisis. I think some of our most disadvantaged children um, won't have had the support, they won't have been able to access digital education. They, if, they've, if their parents weren't treating them very well, often school was the safest and best place for them. And some children may have had particularly bad experiences during this period. If you look at food poverty, I think that's going to have had an impact on people. If you look at special education needs, those children, I think, will have had a real problems. So there is no doubt, whether it's within the state st st sector or between the state and private, there's no doubt that I think the children who have the toughest time normally have had the toughest time now, and that will accentuate the divides, and it's a real problem. So what do you do? Well, first of all, you try to get school back safely as soon as you can. And, you know, that may mean get it commanding more space, church halls, community halls, so that one can come back safely. But we need to get the children back. And, you know, the government said that children who were looked after, who were um, you know, key worker children and so on, who were in, in need, that they could be taught in schools throughout this. But so many didn't turn up. I mean, I've talked to our local councils. They, they were really worried that some of the most needy children just weren't being taken to school to take that opportunity by their parents. Really worry. So what do we do? Well, first of all, I think we have to scrap the Gavin Williamson policy of private tutors to catch up, which is an insult, an absolute insult to teachers and schools. And it's clearly the wrong thing to do. It's just a Tory headline. The idea that private tutors can catch up on all this, you know, all this loss of education in a few hours is just wrong. And also it prevents the schools getting to know the children and how they've coped, because some children will cope better, some will have had better education with their parents than others. The schools need to be able to wrap their arms around the kids who've had a bad time. And giving private tutors is such a bad idea. Give the money to the schools, bring volunteers back and so they can give extra tuition for the, for the children who they, they can identify as needing more. So that's the first thing I do. And then I think we've got to look at the digital divide 
improving access to IT is going to be absolutely key here. You know, we could be a second wave. And those children who've missed out, and Gavin Williamson failed miserably to sort that out. Some schools have worked really well, others not so well. Some areas go get others not so well. Look at what Kirsty Williams did in Wales. A much better approach to making sure those children who didn't have laptops, didn't have access to Wi-Fi or whatever, got more support. And we should learn from Kirsty in Wales to improve what's happening here. So more finances to the schools, uh, more focus on the digital, and working with the schools to identify the different problems that will emerge. Because I, I don't know what they are. How can, how can I know? There'll be some people with mental health problems, some people who've, who've suffered more abuse, some, some kids who've just not had any education at all. So there'll be a, a, a many multi-dimensional approach that will be needed and we need to give the schools the cash and the tools to be able to sort that out. And it will take some time. So this is going to be a sustained effort, a sustained effort. Uh, and it's going to be, you know, multidisciplinary. We're going to have people from mental health coming in, people from counselling coming in. We've got to give the schools all the tools to help our children. We cannot allow this COVID-19 to, 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 to scar a generation of kids. So this has to be a priority. It does indeed. Yes, thank you very much, both of you. Right, so we'll go on to another question now from David Pye. Uh, given that our secondary school students have been caused to follow a curriculum focused on GCSE outcomes, but not appropriate to all, what would be your plans for diversification of that curriculum? And how soon would you look to introduce change? And this is a subject after my heart. So where do the life skills come in instead of the focus on academic? Right, Ed, would you like to start us off on that one? The curriculum. Yeah, well, thanks, Sue, and thanks, David, for the question. Um, I remember a report by someone called Tomlinson. Oh, Do you yes. remember that? That uh, goes back some, some, some <laughs> way when um, uh, Clark was the education minister under Blair. And I thought that was a really good proposal. Uh, where you would really merge academic and vocational education and people could pick and choose what suited them. And schools would have to work together in a proper constructive collaboration to be able to deliver a mixed curriculum of vocational and academic. And, and that is what we need. That's why I talk about a radical rethink of education because David, I agree, pushing all the children down the GCSE route is just clearly not gonna work. It's a nonsense. We have to be more open. Now, of course, there are some choices in the existing system. I'm not saying there's none at all, but it, it's not seen on a par, is it? You know, you're either clever and do GCSE or you're really thick and we put you, you do something else. That's just an unacceptable way to treat, treat our young people. And it doesn't give real choice. Why should, why can't, you know, the clever kids go and do vocational? Like, like they do in Germany and other places. So we've got to rethink this. And by the way, it's not just bringing Tomlinson up to date, which you know wouldn't be a bad start given given the appalling policies of Gove and Cummings, but but it's also a cultural change in our society, because one of the reasons Tomlinson didn't work was the Tories you know ran a campaign the gold standard of A levels, and Blair caved in. What we need to do is to be able to persuade parents, including middle class parents, that actually vocational education something to be valued and treasured and prized just alongside equally alongside academic so i've talked about artisan universities call them technical colleges if you like but call them artisan universities because then maybe the middle class might send their kids there i don't know but let let us be radical on this because so many people over so long have got this wrong but we all know that if we get this right not only will it improve the education opportunities and experiences of all our children and young people but you know what it will be a it will be an engine for social justice because you will see more money going into vocational if we do this and that is where a lot of kids who don't come from families with academic backgrounds end up and if you can raise the the, the incomes of those sorts of, of crafts and traditions and te technical uh, uh, um, qualifications then that, then that will make a big difference for a fairer society as well. Thank you very much. Leila, what, where do you stand on this? Thank you, Sue. So, I mean, first of all, the, the vocational 
academic divide I, I've never bought into at all. And actually, if you look at medicine and law, are they not vocational? Yeah. Um, so actually, in my own experience of, of teaching, some of the best ways that I used to teach physics was to make it practical. We would, you know, look at theme park rides and work out the forces. We would uh, look at wind turbines and teach the environment. And then I would also teach them the physics behind how they worked and how that converts into energy. And we get the kids to make them. And there is an outdated view of how to teach, which Gove and Cummings really pushed, particularly when Gove was in charge of the Department for Education. And it's entirely backwards. What we know now about the brain, its development, it's really changed in the last 10 years. And the reason why I'm, I really dislike the English curriculum at the moment is that it is encouraging a narrowed curriculum. We've seen with Progress 8 that uh, and this is the, the, the eight main subjects that are looked at in order to generate uh, improvement metrics that then get fed into Ofsted. And this whole system has meant a decimation of the creative arts. I've always said it should be STEAM, not just STEM. And the point of school should be to unleash your potential, not to narrow and narrow and narrow. And it's why I actually, as a teacher, I became an expert in a curriculum called the International Baccalaureate, mm. which, was by, which was much broader. And what it did was it understood that children develop and develop their interests over time. And in fact, you can mix and match vocational and academic and actually they are much better interwoven. But the question was also about how would you change it in practical terms and how would you deliver it? Well, our own party's policy, which I'm very proud to have brought in, is to take the curriculum, to take these changes actually out of the hands of the state no longer have people who have no expertise, no real world experience on this, making these decisions. And instead, you have an arm's length body led by experts. And that will be not just teachers, but I would argue also students and parents should be on there, too, so that we can together create a curriculum that is truly broad and is serving the children's right to choose. We often talk about choice. We often talk about parental choice, and that's very important. But very rarely do we talk about choice for the children. And that kind of curriculum, one that allows them to develop and change their minds, isn't that choice? Surely would create a system where they are then ready to enter the world knowing that with all the changes that are coming, and this is the critical bit, all the changes that are coming in the world, and what the, life is rarely simple anyway, that they are ready, they are resilient to it, because what they know most and above all else is that they know how to tackle questions. They know to ask the right questions. And at the moment, our system is far too focused on what is the right answer. Let's turn the system on its head. And just one very final point. I've already been trying to create a way that we can start to change the debate on this because it is a false debate that is being had on terms that are not evidence-based. My master's was in comparative education from the Institute of Education. I'm in politics because I, it's not evidence-based. And I joined the Lib Dems, by the way, because we're the best at it. <laughs> but what I've done is I've brought together a commission. It includes the teaching unions, it includes universities, it includes also people like Make UK, who are representing industry, very vocational. And we have brought together, it's called the Future Perfect Education Commission. It's been meeting for the last 18 months or so, and it's going to be reporting very soon. And the point of this is to start to create a level of evidence-based consensus about what is the best way to start delivering these changes. And by doing that, then you can have changes that last for 20 years, because the other very, very last point is the thing that teachers can't stand is when these changes are imposed top down and happen too quickly for them to be able to embed them properly and really make the most of them. So what has to happen is a cultural change, a change around the entire debate based on evidence, based on what's actually gonna practically work. And I've been working on that for the last 18 months and I can't wait for it to report back. Some of the ideas in it are really very radical and one that's kind of played with a little bit, although it's not landed on because we still need to consult on it is what is the point of GCSEs in the first place? And it asks that very fundamental question. Right. Well, of course, just at the moment, GCSEs are fairly pointless. Aren't well, they? indeed. My, and my granddaughter should have been doing a GCSEs any minute now. And two grandsons who are supposed to be doing A-levels. And, you know, I think they're all asking the questions. What was the point of 
of, uh, of these particular exams. Anyway, we're in strange times. So, right, so can I move on to a question on universities then from Daniel Jones, who says higher education is under pressure with losses predicted of up to 19 billion pounds. And the sector has asked for a bailout of two to two and a half billion pounds, which the government has almost entirely refused. With the risk of universities going bankrupt, and I think there is a very real risk, particularly with the, the loss of overseas students, uh, and jobs being shed rapidly to avoid that, do you believe that the government should step in to preserve universities and courses in the short term? Now, I think who are we starting with now? Uh, Layla, I think we're starting with you, aren't we? Because we've just finished. Yes. So, yes. Thank okay. you, Sue. Thank so you. universities, what are you going to do about universities? Yeah, so so Daniel, yes, I've been, this is very high on my radar um, right now because I've been meeting with vice chancellors. I've been actually meeting also with their finance directors um, about this specific issue. And I've spoken to the Office for Students and Nicola Dandridge to raise some of these points um, because we are facing a real problem. And one of the things that we have to recognize is the value that our university sector brings to this country. First of all, you know, to deliver research and innovation, we all talk about a green recovery. And one of the best ways that we can help to, to, to supercharge that green recovery is to invest in research and innovation. But if you've got universities that are cutting core staff that aren't able uh, to keep academics on, and that's what's happening, is academics are being asked to go on furlough or their contracts are simply not being renewed, we start to shrink the sector. And ultimately that affects students. So there's two things that we need to do here. Yes, I do believe that a bailout should be there. And I think the principle should be that any university that was financially viable before coronavirus should be bailed out to whatever it needs. And every university is ever so slightly different. I've gotten under the skin of this and it really is quite a complex area, but they should be bailed out by the state so that down the line, we keep that expertise. There were some institutions that were just on the cusp and actually there's a conversation to be had about their viability at all. But the other side to it is students themselves. They have had a really raw deal through this whole period. There are students now considering deferring their first year, but in your, if you're in your second or your third year, not only are you facing potentially online only uh, lectures for the next year, as some universities have had, but there are also students who relied on, you know, working in tourism industry, working in uh, industries that right now they can't access to make ends meet. And I think the bailout shouldn't just extend, frankly, to the to the universities themselves. I think there needs to be a specific fund introduced for the poorest students that is a grant where they absolutely know that they can access the money that they need in order to get through. Because my worry is that those are the very poorest students who are going to find themselves unable to make ends meet at this very, very difficult time. Thank you very much, Leila. Ed, how do you feel about universities? Of course they should be bailed out. You know, the government bailed out the banks. If you can bail out banks and bankers, you can certainly bail out students, universities, the investment for our future. And I come on this as an economist. I've got a degree in economics. I put myself through night school at Birkbeck to, to do my master's in economics. And when you look at education over different countries, over different times, there's no doubt that the best thing you can do to invest in your society for social mobility for your economy for productivity and innovation invest in education and that absolutely includes higher education and one of the great things about britain if you look at those sectors where we are world leaders we're world leaders in higher education why would we not support one of the industries if you like that we're a world leader in it would be crazy not to and I think the government's failure is absolutely lamentable. And let's also look at it from a social justice element. You know, I, I'm pretty sure that Oxford and Cambridge are going to survive this. But what about some of the newer universities? You know, I, I'm my local university, Kingston University, just to less than a mile from where I live. Um, it was a poly. It's now a, you've been a university for a while. It's really done pretty well, but. It, but it's struggling. Talk to the vice chancellor, they're really struggling, particularly with the loss of foreign students. So, you know, universities like Kingston are going to need help. 
they're not going to be able to go to the, you know, to the, the funds that a Cambridge or an Oxford have. And what about some of the universities that have been so critical for rebuilding economies in, in rural areas like in Cornwall or in the private areas in different parts of the, the north where HE was seen as a key for the economy? So, you know, I do think the government's got to get its act together. It really, really um, needs to understand the role of that universities play in their local communities and in the wider economy. Uh, I, I just think this is a no-brainer. And you know, they may well have to do it in two parts. They may have to sort out the research side of it. Um, and there's a real opportunity there because, you know, post-COVID, the economy is going to change. It's got to change anyway because of climate change. Can we not put money to the university's way th to, to help them, help us? do the R&D and the thinking for the future. I've been talking about zero carbon flight. We really need to invest in that. We've got some great universities who could do that. Kingston, by the way, is not bad. Um, but also, um, I think we've got to make sure the teaching is there uh, for our students. And maybe we can experiment a bit. Um, maybe we can experiment with distance learning, um, including with foreign students. We're all getting used to Zoom, aren't we? So let's, as well as, ensuring the universe survive this period let's also think about the future and how those investments can help the universities develop so they can play a, a really important role in the green fair economy of the future well thank you very much now i'm basically quite a nice person but i've been asked to ask you both a difficult question <laughs> for you um your record in coalition indeed your other interests um, make, may, might make it difficult for you to gain cut through on education because it's not a topic with which you are generally associated. But education has long been a party strength. So what do you, what, to what extent do you feel you have a weakness in education which might not be good for the party? Well, I have to say I take a um, uh, slight umbrage of that. Uh, and oh, I'm sorry, the... I realised you would, but I, you know, I didn't yeah. phrase well, this question. <laughs> well, I also think the premise is wrong. Uh, first of all, when I was the party's economics advisor, I helped develop the policy of a penny on income tax for education. You did, yes. And that uh, was a really difficult time because actually a lot of the MPs at the time didn't want to do it. But I worked with Paddy. I worked with Matthew Taylor, who was the education spokesperson. Then, and we got it through. We got it through conference. And do you know what? It was our best education policy in the 92 election, the 97 election, the 2001 election. And I was very involved in thinking about how we would spend that money, the reforms that would come with it. So that's a pretty big uh, background over a period of time where we had our education policy that had the biggest cut through of, frankly, the last 30 years. And then uh, uh, when I was education spokesperson for about 18 months, not the exact time, but it wasn't, it wasn't long enough. And I found that, you know, I'd just begun to understand education because it's very complicated. But during that time, I did one major um, innovation. I read a pamphlet by someone called Nick Clegg. You might have heard of him. He was then an MEP and he has a Dutch mother and he looked at the, uh, the Dutch education system and how it promoted social mobility. And with social mobility, they, they gave extra money to, to children from more disadvantaged uh, backgrounds. And um, I took that into our thinking, worked with, with the Liberal Democrat Education Association. We developed the policy of a pupil premium which then Sarah Tether and David Laws uh, fine-tuned and we took it into government and it was implemented. And I think the pupil premium, certainly my experience as a governing uh, as a governor on local school, has been one of the most innovative and progressive education policies since the Second World War. I'm really proud of it. And I think my experience in helping develop that, you know, does uh, put me right for how um, uh, education needs to be a priority in the future. And finally, I'll be honest, I've got two kids. I've got my lovely boy called John, uh, who is very disabled. He has an undiagnosed neurological condition, which means he can't walk or talk and has profound learning difficulties. And working for him with my wife and also actually helping my constituents who've got kids with special education needs, I have a real particular view of the education system from a parent's perspective in a very challenging circumstance. So education, healthcare plans, I can talk you through them if you like. And that really gives me perspective. My little daughter, who's six, you know, she's uh, in year one. And, you know, I've seen what's happened uh, during COVID. I see what happens every day. Uh, I understand 
the desire of every parent to want the very best for their child. So whether it's my experience with my son on special needs, my daughter, or what I've done for the party on education in the past, I think I bring quite a lot of knowledge to this. You know, I, I, I didn't teach uh, like Leila did. That is absolutely true. Um, but when you go around your constituency for 20 years, I've been the MP here for 20 years, you know, going to lots of schools and you really listen to the head teachers and the teachers and the parents and you get a real feel for it. So I think I bring that experience too. Ed, you've convinced me. Right, now Layla's question was, in your contribution to Build Back Better manifesto, you've got reasonably detailed plans for primary and secondary education, but little by way of a concrete plan for tertiary education. So we need to rebuild trust with students, and why should the party trust that you have a vision to sell to students? Again, these are not my questions. I know, and I don't blame you at all. And it's a great question because actually the premise of it, which is that we need to build back trust, not just with students, but with the electorate, and that tertiary education is one of the areas it went wrong. I mean, I too signed the uh, pledge to not raise fees. And the problem with the tuition fees policy in coalition actually wasn't the policy detail itself because there was an issue around how are we going to fund ter tertiary education and there was a debate that needed to be had about how we did that. The problem was that having said we were going to do one thing, we then voted and pushed through something else. And that is fundamentally where that went wrong. It was the politics of it that went wrong. And I do think that we need to lance this boil and that we have a reformed view of what we do with universities. And the reason why I didn't mention it is because my chapter was already 4,000 words long, cut down from six, <laughs> and I could have written a whole other one about this. But broadly speaking, it goes like this. I do think that we need to be moving to a graduate tax. I think we do need to properly fund our tertiary education sector. I don't want to reimpose limits on the number of students who can go to university. Actually, I do think that the biggest problem we've got right now is not about necessarily the fees, but firstly, the perception of the fees as being too much and people feeling that they can't even make ends meet when they go to university in the first place. So I think we should be learning from what Kirsty has done in Wales. She's introduced a really innovative, very progressive grant system for the poorest students that encourages those maintenance loans and maintenance grants there to make sure that they know that they will be absolutely looked after if they decide that university is the way that they want to go. But in England, I think we should be moving to a graduate tax. There's been work done on this by David Howarth. It's ready to go in the party. And actually one of the reasons that we haven't done it is because we haven't had a leader brave enough to say, you know, come on, let's do this. And it won't be necessarily the leader themselves that does it. I think it should be as a party, let's debate this at conference and let's move towards a graduate tax. Okay, thank you very much. Now I'll take a question that's come in on my um, iPhone uh, from David Warren, which is how do you feel about people without degrees entering the teaching profession? Now, if I go back to my young day, there were teacher training colleges where people didn't have degrees, which produced some extremely good teachers. But do you think there is a place now for non-graduate teachers? Who do I come to now? Layla, I'll come to you first, I think, this time, don't I? Thank you. So when I first started teaching, actually, whilst I had a physics degree, I didn't have my teaching degree yet. I learned on the job. And what I discovered straight away was what an art and a science teaching is. It's really difficult. And I think coronavirus is quite interesting because whilst there might have been people before who thought that it was easy, I think we've mm. now got more than ever people recognising how difficult it is to do that job really well. And you can do it easily, very badly. You can do any job badly, easily. But to do teaching well is a real skill. And so I do think that support and training is needed to be a teacher. It's one of the reasons why I think it's right that our party policy is that teachers have qualified teacher status and that they work towards it. But I don't think that it should be the starting point. You can be able to work towards it on the job with professionals, learning all the amazing science that there is out there now about how brains work, about how best to deliver the information, but also about the social and emotional well-being of children. 
and how you do that really well. The two are always inextricably linked and it, it can all be learned. So there is some, and the Tories are really bad at this. They think that actually, if you've got a degree from Oxford in something, then that automatically means that you can teach and that you should be allowed to go into any school and, and just do that. Actually, I'd rather see it the other way around. I'd rather see someone who maybe didn't have a degree, but has a passion for learning, has a passion for teaching, is perhaps really talented at a certain subject because they came to it from a, uh, a, a career first. And we have to be encouraging uh, mid-career people to come into teaching as well. And that they can learn those skills on the job, but we cannot assume that it just happens or it's just a talent. It's something that needs to be nurtured, learned at, because it's really difficult. Uh, I entirely agree. I mean, I'm one of those who, with an Oxford degree, went straight into teaching, and I discovered the hard way that the love of medieval French, which had got me my degree, was no use whatsoever. <laughs> there you are. Thirty grotty teenagers on a wet Wednesday. You know that teaching skills were very, very different. Ed, how do you feel about a non-graduate teaching course? Sue, uh, well, thank you, David Warren, for the question. You know, I said earlier that I thought that vocational education was so important, and that applies to teaching. You know, you don't have to have an ac academic degree to go and teach in a school, but you do need, as Leila said, professional qualified status because the, the, the skill of teaching is a real skill. And, and again, Leila touched on this. Um, I've had to try to teach my little girl uh, basic maths and um, I, I completely take my half to teachers. Um, <laughs> I just failed. Um, and I, whether it was because she was playing up for a daddy or I don't know what, but I was not a good teacher. So um, the skill of teaching is a real skill. And, you know, just because you've studied, as you were saying, you know, ancient Greek or something doesn't mean you can teach. And we've got to value teaching skills far more. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of evidence that says that the best way to improve education in any society, doesn't matter where you live, any society, it's improved teaching skills. And you can be a non-graduate and be a better teacher than a graduate. That's the reason. Uh, and, you know, people in later life can um, get uh, teaching, come in, into, into uh, school, not having had any academic background, but they've, they've gone to a good teacher training course. They've learned the teaching skills and they have a passion for, for teaching children, getting their curiosity going, their creative, uh, their creative skills going. So I, 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 I did object fundamentally to the Tory uh, proposal that um, teachers didn't need qualifications. Do you remember Michael Gove said you didn't need qualifications to teach? Yes. Um, I just thought that was wrong because I think our children are so precious. Our young people are so precious to not just their families, and their community, but our whole society. That, you know, our people are our most uh, uh, important. And... Um, Therefore, it seems to me that you do need to make sure that the people in front of them are qualified, uh, but the qualifications to teach them aren't dependent on degree. I'm, I'm, I'm going around in circles a little bit. You, you take my point. But I, I, just, I just think that um, we need to value the skill of teaching far more uh, than, say, the Daily Telegraph does. <laughs> no, I was in Michael Gove's ministerial team in coalition and oh. I used to have these arguments with him, I have to say, when he told me that teachers didn't really need to be qualified. But oh. still, but there we are. Oh, happy days, eh? Um, right, should we move on to a different top, uh, topic, which is uh, youth services? And there's a question mm -hmm. from Elizabeth O'Keefe saying universal youth services are virtually non-existent because all local authority funding was cut. And any uh, LA work is now reactive and related to criminal behavior. So what will you do to develop and fund universal youth work so that we don't just have uh, the focus on the criminal element, we actually have a proper youth service for all children. And I think I come to Ed first yeah. for this one, don't I? Well, I agree with party policy. Um, and if it wasn't party policy, I'd be arguing for it. Um, and that is that it needs to become a statutory duty for local authorities. Now, before councillors go bananas with me, give them something extra to do by law, it must come with extra resources. And obviously I want to push down 
power, tax raising powers to local authorities. So you don't have to go cap in hand to the government. Uh, so I take that whole review of um, how we source local government. But local government are the best, the best way to deliver youth services, but they need to make sure they do do it. And you know, it, yes, it's important on the the fight against uh, crime, um, because giving young people things to do can be so important to keep them out of the the grasp of, of other people. I, in my constituency, we've had uh, two horrific uh, knife deaths in the last three years, and um, the pain, not just the family, but the mm -hmm. community of that. And we did quite a bit of work on that. And I worked with one of the mothers, Sophie Kafiro, who set up something called Drop a Knife, Save a Life. And it was all about, you know, playing football, giving kids something to do. And she was passionate about that. And, uh, you know, she, she's very big in the African community locally. And um, she saw that as the way forward. But it's not just about crime. Let's face it. It's about things like mental health. Um, you know, you'd need to make sure that um, children who, may, who may, may have a problem making friends, for whatever reason, that they, they have those youth services. And, you know, we were talking about qualifications for teachers a minute ago. What about qualifications for youth workers? They have, they've got, it's a real skill to build supportive relationships with young people. A real skill. Um, and quite quite tough because some some young people can you know they've had some bad lifetime experiences and they go on the street and they they can be angry they can be disruptive and reaching out to them getting wherever they are not necessarily in a, in a traditional youth club but on the streets the street corner going there street street youth workers that can make such a difference so um it's one of those areas of of, of policy which is not often talked about enough and it's not valued anywhere near enough. It's one of those sort of spend to save things. If you invest in youth services, the society will save huge amounts of money and we'll have a, ha a happier society. So what's not to like about investing in youth services? Good, good. Leila, youth services. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm really um, proud of where we've got to with this in terms of party policy, uh, which was uh, to invest 500 million pounds, half a billion pounds. Um, but what we also have to recognize with it is that a lot of that is just replacing money that had been taken out of youth services over the previous years, particularly since 2010 and through austerity. And I remember when that happened here in Oxfordshire and there was a huge crowded room full of people talking about this is going to cost us money in the long term if we take these services away. And there hasn't been a year that I wasn't a parliamentary candidate or as an MP that I haven't had to have a fight to save Wolvercourt Young People's Club, for example. And the reason why I fight so ardently is because these are the most vulnerable children in often our society. They've been successively let down by the system. They often come from homes that have domestic violence in them. They themselves often suffer from special educational needs. This is the one safe place that isn't school where they might be being bullied and it isn't home where they might be witnessing fights and, and Lord knows what. This is somewhere safe that they can go. And it's very often the place where local authorities, children's workers, social care workers, whatever it is, come in and can make that human connection with them. And, and speak to them about what next, their life chances, what's going wrong, helping them to access services. And some of the best work actually isn't what happens inside those rooms. It's also what youth workers go out and do in the community. I met a couple and we, we went on a, on a stroll together around their regular route, around one of the, the uh, council areas uh, that I've got here in, in North Oxford. And they were pointing out, you know, they were had that wonderful relationship with those young people and they were talking to them, but they were out on the streets doing it. Youth workers are heroes. They're absolutely heroes for what they do. They need more funding. They need more support. But it's not just about youth services. We also, I hope, can see that, you know, children's services, particularly sure start centres that have closed, that lack of support around the family, all of this plays into a wider narrative about how the Tories in particular have been letting our children down. They've been letting them fall through the cracks. It's not good enough. And I'm really proud that at, in our last manifesto and as a party in general, 
we speak loud and proud about how important that investment in our young people is. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm involved with the cadet forces and they do a fantastic mm. job, often with disadvantaged kids, yeah. showing them that they're worth something and giving them aspirations. Exactly. The rest of it. Yeah, it's so really important. I think all our youth, youth or, and the scouts and any of the uniformed ones yeah. are vitally yeah. important too, aren't they? Right, so what shall we go on to now? Um, a question from John Thompson. What do you consider to be the key elements of a skills strategy? So, and I think we come to Layla first on a skills strategy. Thank you. So a skills strategy, um, I'm gonna take this to use an opportunity to talk about lifelong learning because <laughs> what we're seeing with coronavirus is that potentially we are, you know, have huge job losses in sectors that are looking like they may not recover anytime soon. And leisure and tourism is of course one, but the potential consequence of Brexit, and we feel this very keenly in Oxford, we've got the BMW plant here. Um, there's a real concern that those workers uh, may find themselves in a position where those companies just start, it's not going to be any one big thing. It'll be that the, the next chassis won't be built here and then they'll, you know, have a workforce that diminishes over time. We're also seeing it with the oil and gas industry, for example, that quite rightly uh, is looking to change, but that is potentially now happening quicker than it would have done before. And a skill strategy to me is actually starting with the premise that education, lifelong learning, being able to access those skills should be something that is available from cradle to grave. It's not something that we stop doing at 18 uh, when the statutory obligation uh, to be in training uh, or vocational work stops. It's actually something that we could need in our 40s, in our 50s, and our 60s. And that's why I was really proud to take to conference a policy that actually Vince Cable and a commission drew up about lifelong learning accounts, where we said that we wanted, actually at the time it was 9,000 pounds at the election, we said 10, but actually I think we should now say it should be greater than that. We should be looking at a much widened account that every single person in the country gets, but is particularly topped up for those who are in vulnerable industries. And if you combine that with a much more regionalized strategy, an industrial strategy. Some of this was started under Vincent coalition, but was not completed. And the Tories never really fully understood how it could be devolved. It could be something that's much more done at a local level, get local councils much more closely involved, not something delivered up here or by LEPs who are unaccountable. Actually, let's make sure that it's accountable to local people as well. And they are really well placed to have that joined up approach when you come to talking about skills and skills that are available to all at whatever point in their life they may need them. Thank you. Ed, skills strategy. Well, first of all, you've got to work out um, what are the skills that you're asking the FE sector and other skill providers to, to invest in. And that's got to start locally. It's got to start with what the local needs are for the local economy, the local employers, the local public sector, and so on. And, uh, you know, local government could be more involved, but certainly the local colleges need to make sure that they are providing the courses for apprenticeships, for, um, you know, other technical and craft skills so that um, they, they know that they, they are meeting the needs. Um, I would add into that, though, the need to future-proof by which I mean, you know, the skills of the future that the future employers are going to need may not be quite the same as of the, of the current. So I particularly think of climate change. So, you know, we're going to have to replace lots of gas boilers. Um, we're going to have to, you know, insulate homes more. And I, I'd like, as part of my green e economic recovery plan, to make sure that we're supporting FE colleges and other trained providers with the money so they can actually uh, help um, people of, of all ages, frankly, to get the skills that are gonna be uh, needed. So that's the first part of it, what are the, what are the skills? Um, you've also got to, it's not just be supply led, it's gotta be demand led, you know, people will wanna make choices about their own lives. So we've also got to make sure that uh, we, could, we, we trust people and uh, they're able to do things that are enthusiastic uh, about. So that's the, the first bit. Um, who are the best providers? Well, um, I think the FE sector has been massively undervalued in this. For me, it's a sector which 
can needs to grow if we're going to be stronger on vocational education. Um, it's got to work with schools and local local community because schools that need to be more into vocational education. But I think the FE sector for me has always been the one that's been underplayed. I mean, take my own area, Kingston College, which um, has really, really improved in recent years. And it's part of a consortium now, South Thames Colleges. Uh, and um, they they're really are providing a, a wide range of, of options. Um, and they're bringing older people uh they're providing much better careers advice so you know john a really good skill strategy has got to look at both sides um i do know we can do a lot better than the current lot uh, and we need to because i think if we don't get that skill strategy right we won't tackle social injustice and we won't be a more productive economy so there are so many reasons that push you to invest in fe and invest in skills Thank you very much, both of you. Right, a question from Michelle Tilly. What role do you feel education has in the current political and social climate? And what does your ideal future look like? My goodness me, that could, Ooh. we could range far and wide on that, couldn't we? <laughs> right. Ed, do you want to kick off with that one? The role well, of education? It, yeah. Well, it got to start from liberal values um, as a liberal party. And that means you start with the individual and you're saying that the education that the state needs to support is to make sure that individual can realize their talents. And if you do start from that perspective and you see education provided by the state as helping the individual be the best they possibly can, no matter their background, you end up in a very different place from where we are now, it seems to me different in terms of resources you're putting in, but actually different in the way we've organized because we are very top down. We are very centralist. You know, we've gone down a standards route, which is squeezes the creativity out of education. I'm not saying there aren't great teachers out there and great people doing wonderful things at creative, but I do find that the, 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 the league tables approach, the, the, the focus purely on uh, academic, has has is undermining what education can provide for the individual and that's why i called in my opening remarks for you know a a great liberal education debate um because i think if we did that we wouldn't start by tweaking the existing system because you get to a point with a system it could be in any any part of the uh, of, of society where, where the system it ain't you just can't tweak it anymore now, getting from where we are to where we need to be from this sort of stop, top down, regular, regularized, standardized system to where we I think we need to be. You've got to manage that because you don't want to be too disruptive from people's lives. Um, you want to take take schools and colleges and universities with you. Of course you do. Um, but I think the appetite for what I'm talking about would be absolutely huge. I think you would excite teachers. I think you'd excite schools. Because you'd be saying to people, you know, you, you want to talk to to the individuals and and, and get their enthusiasm, build on, on, on what they want to do. Uh, and if you ensure that they've got making informed decisions, that's quite important, that you know, they get proper careers advice, that they are able to make their choices and they understand the implications of making a choice now, what it means in the future. As long as they have that support in making decisions, then then surely we want to. We want to enable those individuals to make their, those choices. So, uh, I, I do think um, I do think Michelle, we need quite a radical change, quite radical. Okay, thank you, Leila. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I have to say, to do this again in <laughs> two minutes is is way too short. And actually, this is very much the focus of the Future Perfect Education Commission. And where we have ended up is starting by recognizing that the system as it is actually the understanding of what's wrong with it just isn't there we need to start by showing people what's going wrong and fundamentally what is the purpose of education it's to bring out the best in every single child every single individual to give them that equality of opportunity so that they can make the most of their life in a way that they choose and yet we've got a system that is very narrow where unless you pass through these hoops, then you are seen as a failure. 
that you're not adequately supported, where teachers feel that they are very much imposed on and they've got often several degrees and yet they aren't trusted by the state. And if you look at the evidence, and I'm absolutely evidence led when it comes to education. In fact, I'm non-tribal when it comes to education. To educate a child takes 20 years. And in fact, cradle to grave, it takes the whole of a lifetime. So we need to take an approach where if we're going to make changes, we know to the best of our ability that it's going to work. And what does that look like? Well, it starts, first of all, by recognizing that experts have a part to play in this. The best education systems in the world actually have some of the best trained teachers in the world. And that's where we need to start. On day one, if I were education secretary, I'd put a huge amount of money into teacher training. But it's also curriculum that puts the child at its heart and not just a curriculum in the academic sense, one that recognizes that development is not just intellectual, it's also about the emotional and social development of children. And by having strong pastoral links, some of the best moments of my teaching career was when quite often after class, someone would sidle in asking for help with a difficult maths equation or something like that. And then we'd get going and talking about actually, what is it that's really bothering them right now? And sometimes they would divulge that they were self-harming, that they were struggling with bullying, that they were struggling with their sexuality, whatever it was. And, and actually having the time to be able to have that one-to-one -one connection with my students was some of the most important work that I did. And that's gone. It's gone from a system that is so cut to the bone in terms of funding cuts. But the system itself, even with all the money in the world, now needs to learn from the other countries in the world that are doing this really well. And it's centered around the child. It's centered about giving them choice, giving them resilience, giving them the realization that they are worthy, that they have the ability to do whatever it is that they want to do. And the job of the state is to help them to do it. And those are the aims of such a system and it can exist. And what I'm already starting to do is to draw together people like the CBI, like Make UK, like Warwick University, like the NEU, the NAHT, these all sit on my commission. And we're putting the best heads together to come up with what this plan is going to look like. And then we need to start to sell it to every political party, to every parent, to every employer across the country so that they can see that there is another way that we can do this that's going to be beneficial to the whole of our society. Thank you very much. Right, now there's a question from Peter Taylor here that, who says COVID-19 has forced many parents and caregivers to home educate their children. Do you think more people should be encouraged to do this? I mean, home education is quite a vexed issue, isn't it? But still, Leila, what do you feel about home education? So I think my Ed has already confessed that he found it quite difficult to teach his daughter maths. In, so, indeed, yeah. and actually my, my own view is that it has to be whatever is right for the child. And there are lots of parents, and in fact, I have a friend who has decided that this period of coronavirus where she has uh, really enjoyed being at home with the kids and she's been teaching them really well, and actually they've thrived when they haven't been in that school. And her own decision for them is that it's a positive thing that she wants to do for her children. And so she's decided to embark on this journey. And I, first of all, feel that the state system in of itself has let her down. And the reasons why she's doing it is because she feels that the curriculum is too narrow, that they aren't getting that individual attention, that actually her children are more creative when they're at home. They're more able to express themselves when they're at home. And if we got the system right, then I think there would be far fewer parents who felt that it was the better thing to do to actually not homeschool them. When they then make that leap, they aren't very well supported. And in Oxfordshire, actually, we have an incredible group of parents who do this uh, and work together and, and help with the socialization of the children, And uh, but they don't get any much resource towards it. And so if it is going to be a genuinely positive choice, not one because the local school isn't good enough, but one where you've got a, a system that really helps all children to thrive, I think that's the first step. But the second step is when it happens, then it needs to be properly resourced. And the third reason why people often do this and I'll leave it to Ed to talk about this more and you'll see hopefully why in a moment, but it's because special educational needs is not well served in our mainstream system. And we have to make sure that those students who think differently 
or have health needs that aren't being met in the system every step of the way have the support that they need, whether it be in a mainstream school, whether it be in a special school, those children need bespoke support and perhaps a hybrid where they're in some days and some days at home. But those most vulnerable children are not well served in our system. It's underfunded. It, there's so much pressure on parents to fight for their children when actually it should be the state that is providing this because you judge i think a society on how it treats its most vulnerable and there are far too many children both in school and who are being homeschooled because of special educational needs that are not being served well enough by this government at the moment thank you and ed yes and you know picking up particularly the special educational needs side of that yes I'll, your... I'll, come, I'll come on to that but let me start with liberal values it does seem to me whether it's value of freedom and whether it's the value of choice and looking at every individual's need, home education must be an option. Um, home education is really good for some children. Yes, parents need support and we do need to make sure children are safe and getting the basic education. But if we can be more flexible uh, in it, I, I, I actually think this could be good for some children. And there are some children who have r real problems at school, you know, being bullied and uh, and that doesn't get sorted out. I mean, I've often been told that traveller children can prefer home education, children with some health issues. So um, I think we do need an education policy which is open to this, understanding where there can be downsides, but making sure that this is an option that isn't poo-pooed by so many. And um, I'll give you an example, uh, Leila sort of invited me to, um, my son John, um, I've told you about his disabilities. Initially, we we tried special schools, and we tried two special schools, and we really, really tried, um, and they didn't work. And the, the reason they didn't work is that the schools weren't listening to us. And, and we, we know John better, better than they do, but they weren't listening to us. And uh, with reluctant hearts, we, we took him from the second one, which had been, you know, won lots of awards, but just wasn't helping him with his needs. We tried to find another school, we couldn't. And so we just said to each other, well, let's home educate him. Not ourselves, because as I said, with respect to my daughter, I don't think I'd be a great teacher, but we got in professionals um, and Emily sort of managed the system uh, in her amazing way with teaching, occupational therapy, physio, and speech and language. And the system we put together and said to the local authority, we'd like this for John, it was a lot cheaper than sending to a special school. So I, they initially didn't like it, but then they, they they understood it and they understood that we were looking after John's social needs as well, because he goes disabled horse riding, he goes swimming, he goes tricycling, he goes rock climbing, he goes to a youth club. You know, we make sure he has that social interaction as well. So that experience of home teaching um, a special needs child um, has sort of linked me into other, uh, linked us into other families. And what it showed me is that sometimes you need, schools just aren't able, even special schools aren't able to meet the needs of every child. And why were we surprised at that? You know, um, that's likely to happen. <laughs> that's what human beings are like. And you know, I'll end on this because it's a very optimistic note. When we started home educating John, he was nonverbal. And we thought we, we'd already learned a lot of sign language, but we thought we would do more sign language. And we were talking to the local authority about trying to get a group in the community of other kids who were nonverbal so they could sign to each other. And we were quite excited about that. And then guess what? We were more excited because he started to talk. He said, Daddy. And um, home education has been the best thing for him. And, you know, that's one child. It's our child. It's pretty close. Um, but I'm sure there are other children who, who, who blossom because of home education. So um, I, will, I will fight for that. Now, I, my amazing wife does so much of it. But seeing the impact it had on John um, and, you know, he, he can't talk like you, you and I can. But he can say stuff. Um, and the idea that he can put sentences together now 
would have been unthinkable two and a half years ago. The special schools didn't believe it was in him. So I, I'm afraid, to, uh, Peter, I believe home education is right for some kids. Good. Well, can I then follow that up with a question that's come in um, uh, through text from Matt D, who asks how we go about changing the culture of discrimination towards people with autism and or learning difficulties? Uh, yes, Ed, would you like to follow up on that one? Because there well, is a culture of discrimination. Yeah, I mean, um, partly through my constituency work and partly through my work with John, I've been quite involved in uh, campaigning for disabled children. And the mo I'm a patron of something called the Disability Law Service. And we've done a study uh, with various other groups, Cerebra, um, University, and we've looked at how local authorities um, uh, are not always um, doing what they're supposed to for autistic children under the law. And we found that there are 42 local authorities. We're not going to name them because that would be wrong. We're going to write to them and ask them to put their house in order. 42 local authorities who are breaking the law because they are, have a policy called Autism Plus, which effectively means that uh, a parent comes along and says, my child's autism, we, we'd like a, a, an assessment, please, proper assessment, as is your right under the law. These authorities were not doing that. Um, and they would only allow assessment if there was a medical diagnosis of autism or there was another disability. That actually is against the law, it's against the human rights. And so we've exposed this um, and we'll be writing to those local authorities. Obviously, it's, there's money issues, but so many local authorities are managing this. They're doing it the right way. They're keeping to the law. So those local authorities who are breaching it need to be need to be uh, brought up. And I'll give you that answer, Matt, is, is that um, that's something I sort of do outside of my political life, if you like. Um, but I'm I'm passionate about campaigning for the rights of disabled kids um, and disabled adults, frankly. Um, but autistic children, because autism is so varied, you know, it's a huge spectrum, isn't it? And um, I don't think local authorities and, frankly, ministers really take it as serious as it needs to be taken. And, you know, I think, um, I just think we've got a long way to go to really understand autism. Uh, and we need to think quite deeply about it. Because you know what? If you get it right, the child and the young person can blossom. And so this is definitely worth something that liberals should be fighting for. Uh, and I think if we if we stand up for disabled people, and autistic kids and young people, you know, I think we would make ourselves a more liberal society. And let's fight Johnson's Tories on this. Let, let's 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 take it to them. Right. Leila, and we'll only have one more question after this before we because I think you've done a grand job. Leila, would you like to speak on, on um, the culture against disabled people? I would. Thank you, Sue. And thank you, Matt, uh, for the question. And I'm reminded of the, actually the very first year that I was a, a teacher. I was um, teaching maths and actually it was in a school that had, as part of the, the mainstream culture, uh, mainstream school, there was a special school that was linked and we had the, the same ethos, the same principles behind it, but then there were specialist teachers. And the reason why uh, that was so fascinating to me was what it meant was that those students who had some quite severe learning disabilities would be able to come to some classes and not others in a mainstream setting and then be able to go somewhere else afterwards. And I remember that there was this boy who came to my class and he was severely autistic, but he was so wonderful and absolutely obsessed by maths. And it's a very, you know, classic uh, stereotype almost of an autistic child, but he was incredible. And I remember learning, you know, and it was my first year of teaching and I had a lot of support and actually being able to understand him, being able to understand autism more broadly, then carried me through very well as a teacher. And my understanding of special educational needs only grew from there because we had a culture embedded in the school where we understood that those with special educational needs think differently, but they're not worse. 
actually it was about finding the right support for them, finding the right way of engaging them in our broader community. And if you can do that, what I saw from, from this boy was he flew when he had that support in place. And it takes great skill, but it also takes flipping on its head the way that we think currently about disability in the classroom. Because one of the things that I think is great that we brought in uh, in coalition is EHCPs. I think there should be a right for parents to be able to ask for that support and that support be given. The problem we have now with a system that is so underfunded is that the fight for those EHCPs just gets bigger and bigger. The bar gets higher and higher. In Oxfordshire, it can take up to two years for a child with autism to get the EHCP, which then allows them to be able to go to one of our, our brilliant special schools locally. And the reason partly for that is underfunding in the CAM service, that's the Children and Adult Mental Health Service. And I spend so much of my constituency office time fighting on behalf of children and families to get those EHCPs. But what I also hear is that one of the reasons why those special schools are increasingly under pressure is that that support in mainstream schools has diminished. It used to be that you had a SENCO, an SEND coordinator who would be paid for often by the local authority, maybe covering one, two schools, or indeed there were schools, big secondary schools that would have a team of them whose job it was to help and support those students who think differently in the classroom so that they're able to thrive. And that is where I think we need to go next. We have to change the culture in schools. We have to change the culture in the whole of society to see autism and other learning disabilities for what they are, which is another way to its diversity and it's beautiful. And if you can support them, they can achieve extraordinary things in our society. And it's a discrimination that I don't just think exists in schools, as I say, I think it exists in the whole of society. And as liberals, we are really well placed to make the argument for how we can approach this differently. Thank you very much. Well, I think you've both been brilliant. So I think we shall come to the winding up speeches now. Um, so two minutes. So Leila, could you give us two minutes and what should members take away from this? Fantastic. Well, first of all, thank you all so much for being here this evening on what I have to say is my specialist subject. It's what I came into politics to do. I woke, I remember vividly i was doing this masters in comparative education at the institute of education and i learned about the deep inequalities in educational attainment in this country and having lived in parts of the world like you know ethiopia in the late 80s jamaica jordan who just don't have the resourcing that we do i thought to myself this cannot be right it cannot be right that in this country we have that level of inequality. And I remember saying to myself, I'm gonna change this. I'm going to become an MP. And it was at that point that I picked our party and I saw our values. I also matched our own party policy with what research said. And I, I made sure that, that it was close enough. And then I remember coming to conference and speaking against a motion because I didn't feel it went far enough. Education for me is a burning passion. And at the center of it is the individual, is the person who I want to help to thrive. My whole career as a teacher was about bringing out the best in other people, everyone else around me. And that is what I want to do as leader. I want to do that for the party. I want to do that for our members. I want to do that for our local parties as well. If you empower them, then that's how you get the best out of society. And we have to change as a party. We are at 6% in the polls. If we want to change the country, then we have to be strong again. And it's bottom up and it's done by education and training. And in our own approach, we should live these values. Make sure that there is investment in individuals, make sure that there's investment in members, in our campaigners, so that we can go out there, put education front and center. Let's be the party of education again and show people how liberalism can make a massive difference to not just this country but also the whole of the planet thank, thank you thank you very much Leila Ed your two minutes wind up then thank you all for your questions and thanks to Sue for chairing particularly coming in at the last minute educational skills are so central to the whole purpose of liberalism and our party it's great we've had to tonight's debate 
And I'm convinced we need a new liberal debate on education. England's education system just isn't working for so many children and young people. Yes, there are many wonderful examples of success. In our zeal to improve people's lives, we mustn't fall into the trap of talking down the fantastic achievements of so many young people, their teachers, schools, colleges, and universities. Yet no one can be happy with today's centralized, constraining education system. If we want a fairer society, and frankly, if we want a more productive economy too, we must reform it and make investment in education and training a top priority. And make sure extra cash does deliver greater social justice with well-targeted policies like our flagship pupil premium policy. We need to target above all early years education with free quality childcare. And we need to be the champion of vocational skills education too. Yet significant extra finance alone won't make the radical transform transformation we need, even if it's well targeted. We do need to rethink education, starting with the pupils, starting with the parents, building bottom up. You know how parents respond to something for their children. We've got to get into that. We've got to make sure that children, young people get the education that suits them, not the education some minister like Michael Gove thinks they should have. Let's also focus on the children who've experienced adverse childhood experiences, from witnessing violence and abuse to growing up in a household where substance abuse and mental health problems damage the parental bond. We've got to think of those children, from young carers missing out on education to looked after children. I want an education policy that prioritizes the most vulnerable and the most disadvantaged. Friends, we used to be known as the party for education. We can be again. Let's develop new radical ideas and campaign in every village, town and city so we win again on education. Thank you. Ed and Leila, thank you both so very much. You are both inspirational people and the party is going to be in really good hands. Uh, and we do appreciate all the effort you've put into this. Can I thank all the people who've put in questions as well? And once again, apologies if your question wasn't actually called. And thank you to Jack, who sort of sorted all this out for us. Uh, I have to, uh, coming shortly, is the next national event. I'm sure, Ed and Leila, you're really looking forward to this. <laughs> it's on Wednesday, and that's focusing on race equality and it's being hosted by the Lib Dem campaign for racial equality so please and thank you all very much indeed for joining us tonight I'm Sue Garden and thank you very much and good night and go and have a good rest the two of you you have worked so hard tonight thank you very much bye bye cheerio and thank you very much to our signers thank you bye yeah